back in the house of the Lord tonight with each one that's present. Hope you've had a good afternoon. Truly the Lord bless us and let us assemble ourselves again in his house to worship and praise him. And truly we need to be with uh, those prayer requests that's made this morning and others today that uh, throughout the week and days have been made unto us. You know we're prone sometimes I think to forget those requests that you and I hear and we just finally pass them by and we forget to all those uh, requests. Maybe we cannot remember definitely what those requests might have been. But you know the Lord, He always knows. And so all we have to do, I think, is mention to the Lord of those requests that uh, were requested of us to, to, to pray for them. And so maybe we can continue to pray for those tonight and pray for each one who needs their prayers. And certainly we live in a time of history whenever there needs to be a lot of praying, and I need to be uh, praying a lot more. And I'm assuming that all of us need to be praying a lot more and talking to the Lord more. So us be much in prayer. And certainly as you pray and talk to the Lord, I appreciate it very much if you mention my name as you talk to him. I thought tonight that we might, uh, uh, if you would, turn your Bible to the 122nd Psalm and stand and read this Psalm responsibly tonight as we start the service tonight. 122nd Psalm. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Peace within thy walls, and prosperity within thy house. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this 
wonderful song. We thank you for the word of God. Now, Father, we thank you that we can read it, we can study it. Now, Father, we can quote it, we can do whatever we, Lord, desire in our churches today of sharing thy word. And now, Father, we have the freedom and liberty to do this, and we're grateful today. Dear Lord, we come before you tonight. There's many people in whom we need to remember in prayer, and I especially pray for those requests that were made unto us today, and throughout this past week, and even the weeks prior. Dear Lord, I cannot remember all of them, but Lord, you do. And I just pray for each one of them in a special way tonight that you might hear and answer these requests according to your plan and purpose for their lives, for their father's circumstances and what they might have been made. Then, Father, we come tonight in behalf of this service. You know the needs of every one of us that are assembled here. You know our heartbeat. You know the thoughts of our minds. And, and I, Father, I pray tonight, dear Lord, as we assemble in thy house, I pray that God, as you just hear and answer each one of our requests tonight, of every one of them, we thank you for each one's presence, for each home that's represented. And Lord, you know uh, each household, and you know, Lord, their physical and needs, and also their spiritual needs, and we pray that you might supply those. We continue to pray for those that are lost, Lord, and especially those that are lost in this community that need Jesus tonight. And I pray, God, thy convicting spirit might touch their hearts and lives with that great conviction, Lord, that they've never been convicted before. I pray for those that grown cold and different, and Lord, uh, have got their priorities, Lord, uh, uh, misplaced. And Lord, they need to uh, get their priorities straightened out in their lives, and I pray Jesus for them tonight. Then I pray tonight, dear Lord, if we think about our world situation, we pray for our world, we pray for our nation, we pray for the president on down, the leaders of our nation. We pray for those in uniform, and those, Lord, that are going and still going and called being called out. And dear Lord, we pray especially for these, our Father, as we think about those that are having to leave their families behind. But our Father, there are even dads and moms that are having to leave all, uh, uh, their children behind, both of them going to service, Lord. Uh, well, I just pray today for these dear families in a special way. Bad enough when it's just one, but much, much less two. Now, Lord, we pray for your missionaries throughout the world. We pray for those that are sick of our church, Lord, and we just pray that, God, your healing hand be upon those, for those of the breeze, and for our Lord, for uh, uh, the ever leader and officer of this church. God, we're grateful. We thank you for them. And I pray, Jesus, that we might be uh, become the spiritual people in which Jesus you'd have us to be, that we want to walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, and be obedient to the Spirit of God. Now forgive us of each sin, Lord, because we are sinful people, and I pray that you cleanse us afresh in you tonight as we confess our sins unto you. And Father, again, we thank you for the, a beautiful day and for the bountiful blessings of it. For we pray in Christ's name and for his sake we ask it. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
come to Martha back again. There is nothing behind me. All the treasures I used to love have all faded from you. There is a new day ahead for me. All my heartache is over. For I left it on Calvary, where my new life began. I'm come too far to the back. My feet have walked to the valley. I'm climbed mountains, cross rivers, there's some places I know. But I'm nearing the home shore, the redeemed are rejoicing, heaven's angels are singing, I've come too far to the back. Look around, there's no happiness, there's no reason for living. Life will give you a broken dream, full of sorrow and fear. Turn around on the back again, face the new day before you. Waste your heartache in Jesus' hands. He can mend broken dreams. I've come too far to the back. My feet have walked through the valley. I've climbed mountains, crossed rivers, desert places I know. But I'm nearing the home shore. The redeemed are rejoicing. Heaven's angels are singing. I've come too far to the back. Y'all like to ask me to have Coke and Jason or you have Coke and Sunday? It'll go on probably another three or four days. Um, I thought this morning before I sang, sang that song, uh, Thank You, Lord, for your blessings on me. I can truly say that. But I, I know me and Brother Lynn will get in an argument. I believe the Lord's been good to me, better to me than anybody else. And he'll get up there and he'll say that. And I'll say, No, that's not right. You know? but, uh, I was thinking as, as all of us helped him in here this morning, uh, everybody was here. Um, could say the same thing that they were sitting here. They'd say, you know, they could sing that song within their own heart. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings on me. Uh, this next song we're going to sing is, it makes it worth it all, even though we have troubles and trials here. Uh, just think about what Jesus can do. And uh, there's hope and looking forward to Jesus.
still the same. Go ahead and bury me, for very soon I will be free. I don't know how many of you noticed that. I had on special music, I hope and pray. So I, I, they, I, they answered their prayer, didn't they? I'd been praying to have some special music, so I'd put out there hope and pray we'd have special music today. And so thank you for blessing our hearts. I want to think about something tonight that's not too pleasant and talk. You know, really, no time is sin pleasant, but I want to think about a subject tonight, the results of sin. Uh, now, I can't get into all the results, but I want to just name a few of them tonight, some, some results of sin and sin, what sin brings about. And so if you want to be turning, turning your Bibles to James chapter 1, chapter 1 of the book of James. But before we get into it, I, I read some, um, you know, uh, some questions that were asked teenagers. And the question was about um, what about some laws? What are some laws that you would like to see changed? What do you think those teenagers answered and some laws they would like to see changed? One of them said, I wish they'd change the law where that all 18 years could buy beer, be lot in every state, nationwide, that it be permissible to buy, that it be legal for 18-year-olds to get beer. Another one said, I wish that they'd change the law where you could get your driving license at 14. Another one said, I wish to change the law and that of gambling, that they'd lower the age limit on gambling. Another one said, I wish they'd change the law and that of making legalizing mayor what? They went ahead to say because that alcohol kills so many each year and each month and it is legalized and therefore they thought then that marijuana ought to also be legalized. With all of them, about seven or eight of them, different things, and uh, uh, that the answers and, and the laws they'd like to be changed, there was one, I think it was on a positive note, we might say. One of them said, I believe that the law ought to be changed, that those that are caught drunk and driving, that the penalty ought to be stiffer, that the fine ought to be more, and the time to serve are to be a longer period of time. But as I read those, I begin to think about, is that the trend? Is that the thinking of all of our, practically all of our teenagers today? Do they want these things literally 
Do they really want these things? What are we teaching them? What are we instructing them? And that of life and what's the importance of life. Do they get the idea perhaps from us that this is the real important things in life? Think about it tonight. What are we really teaching them today? Well, beginning with verse 12, we notice these words. In chapter 1 of the book of James. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that have of him. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is thrown away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every, pardon me, every good gift, and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of light, with whom is no barrenness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with his word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all the filthiness or superfilthy of naughtness, and receive with meekness the engraft word which is able to save your soul. But be you doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Sin always brings results. You know, these results are always evil. They're never good. They're never good in any way. We notice that no sinner... No sinner can punish, uh, escape the punishment of a holy and righteous God. Because God is holy, and because that God is righteous, he must punish sin. He's got to punish sin because he is holy and because he is righteous. A holy God demands that sin be dealt with and also be punished. Whether it's in your life, or my life, or whether it's in the best person's, moral person's life, or whoever it might be. But we notice some things about sin. You know, sin, I think, and according to the Bible, consumes beauty. You know, sin robs you and I of beauty. I'm not talking about physical beauty, although it does rob a lot of people of their physical uh, beauty of life. Sin. Some of the most beautiful women, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the world has been robbed of that beauty because of sin in their life, because of sinful life in which they live. The beauty has left them. There is no real physical beauty about them anymore. And that beauty, you know, sin will rob uh, uh, not that physical beauty, but it will uh, rob a beautiful life. It will it, uh, rob a beautiful character. It'll rob a, 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 a beautiful place, or it'll, a, it'll rob a beautiful home. Uh, you know, sin destroys, and it robs us. The Bible said in the book of Psalms, When thou, with, with rebuke, dost correct man for iniquity, thy makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. It said that his beauty diminishes. His beauty is removed. Iniquity does it. That's what this verse is saying. It says that sin will remove the beauty. You know, as I think about some of perhaps you, the ugliest people perhaps that you and I have ever saw, physically speaking, you know, uh, we look at them and uh, outwardly they're, they're ugly and they're real ugly, physically speaking, but inwardly, they're the most loving, kind, sweet people that you might know. You know, this is what Jesus Christ does for an individual. 
regardless of our outward appearance. The Lord can make us wonderful and sweet and beautiful on the inside. But sin, sin robs us of these things. Sin robs us inwardly. Sin robs us outwardly. Sin robs us everywhere of our lives. And so we find this is for the penalty of sin. People who were what? You know, uh, had beautiful uh, things in life. How, uh, and beautiful in, uh, in life have become hard looking. And they have hard faces. And they become ugly. And all these things. And you know some people, uh, think about this. How did the, the devil takes them and consumes them and uses them. And they become uh, mean and ungodly. And sin bring, uh, happens in their life. And this brings, it's brought about by sin in their life. So sin consumes beauty. Secondly, you know, the Bible talks about, and we think about this old world of ours, and we think about the heavens, we think about the earth, and I thought about the heavens, and I thought about the earth, and, and I thought about the heavens. Even the heavens today are not clear. And pure. You know, we think about all the pollution in the world. You think about how uh, the heavens is polluted. Think about how the earth is polluted and how the, uh, the pollution in the entire world. You know, as we were leaving out today, and, and I mentioned to death about uh, one of our neighbors that had cancer, and I said, did you hear Roger say they had to take her back to the hospital? They'd found cancer elsewhere in her body. They said, no, I didn't hear that. And I said, yes, they had to carry Doris back. And then she said, you know, they tell us to get out in the fresh air. And if the fresh air is good for you, but said, I wonder today, is the fresh air, is it fresh anymore? Think about all the things that, you know, and they tell us even as far as flu and, and other diseases in life, you know, and, and they say that it, it's in the air. It's in the air, and a lot of it comes through the air, although we might not even be around a person with, with, with some kind of virus or some kind of flu, but yet we take it and we wonder, well, where did it come from? It comes through the air. The air is polluted. The earth is polluted. The heavens are polluted, see? And, and the heavens are corrupted. And so we find sin brings about corruption. We notice the Bible, the Bible talks about that sin is corrupted in the heavens, and they're unclean in the sight of God. We find this, and we find this in, in, the book, in Psalms there again, how that the psalmist said, as he looked in the heavens and he said, God, oh, how he, how he made the heavens so pure, and how that they were so clean, and how the, how the air and everything was so purified. But he said, man has corrupted it, and man has brought about corruption in the heavens, and man has brought about corruption on the earth today. Because of man's sin, that's the penalty of sin. You know, the very heavens of this world will pass away because of sin. That's the reason the Bible tells us that we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth is because of sin in the heavens and the earth of this day. And so we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth because it's the Lord, he, he don't want this kind of heaven and he don't want this kind of earth to be in the place that we shall go to receive. And so he, he said that he'll just, he'll just uh, 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 have a, uh, build another uh, uh, new heaven and he'll just have another new earth. And so we'll go there to be. And so you think about uh, it corrupts the heavens, it corrupts the earth. Sin corrupts. Not only that, but sin, as we notice here, it leads to spiritual death. We talk about death and we sing about death and we think about death. Spirit, what is spiritual when we're talking about spiritual death? What are we talking about spiritual death? Spiritual death means a separation. It means that God and man is separated. How long are they separated? Spiritual death means that man has separated from God for eternity. Not just a few weeks, not just a few months, not just a few years, but it is for eternity. Think about it. That's spiritual death, and that's what the Bible talks about. Spiritual death means it's separated from the life of God. You think about being separated from the life of God throughout eternity. Thinking about never being with the Lord throughout eternity. And, and you know, and also uh, uh, ever, ever unsaved sinner. When you and I were unsaved, we were spiritually dead. And we were not uh, made alive until we come to know Jesus. And if we continue to live until we die, the spiritual death, we've been eternally separated from the Lord. That's a sad thought to think about that many today are traveling that very road. And they're going down the same road that you and I travel. And they're going to come to the crossroads of life. 
and they're going to have to make a, a decision. They're going to have to make a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore uh, go back to uh, and go in the right direction and uh, according to the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only does it lead, sin lead to spiritual death, but also it leads to physical death. You remember, sin is a, the Bible said that sin is a killer. The Bible said that even Jesus Christ said, you know, Satan was a murderer. Sin is a murderer. You know, I wondered, I, I wonder so much about today. And it, it bothers me, I don't know about you, but of all the murders today, every day, right around us, we hear of somebody being murdered. And, and, and just like, uh, you know, uh, we talk about these people being murdered today, and, and, and I remember hardly ever we heard of anybody being murdered or killed. Just like uh, that preacher said this week, and, and all of us, I think, can, can, can relate with him, you know, where, uh, there where he said it. You remember? Uh, he said, I remember, as he was said, I was raised in Arkansas. I remember when I was a boy, he said, we never had to lock the doors. We never had to do any of those things. He said, now we have to lock up everything, and then they still get it. You know. We remember those days, too. But those days are past. Those days are gone. Why? Because of sin. I, I'll never forget this, and, and I'm, I guess I've shared it with you before, and, and, and pardon me for sharing it with you if I have. And I'll never forget, we went to evangelistic conference, you know, and, and this preacher, he was up a preaching, and he was really getting at it, you know, and he asked a question. He, just like sometimes I'll ask a question, he said, what's wrong with the world today? No old Percy Fuller, he was sitting there on, on, the, on the edge of that pew, you know, and he's really taking it in, and all of a sudden he said, sin, brother, sin. Sin. So sin is a problem today. We got a big problem today. We got a sin problem. I have a sin problem in my life. You have a sin problem in your life. Our world has a sin problem. Our nation has a sin problem. Our churches have sin problems. Our homes have sin problems. We've got sin everywhere. But Jesus is the remedy. Jesus is the remedy. You know, we have these horrible diseases. I mentioned cancer a while ago, and, and we have so many that uh, really they, they, there's no really cure for cancer. And then it reminds me, you know, and I think about it, and it's even worse. Cancer, you know, they, they back in the Old Testament, it talks about consumption. Remember that? The Bible talks about consumption in the Old Testament, which is uh, in our term, uh, medical term we call TB. And it used to be a real killer, you know. And, and uh, so we find that the but I don't think that the TB, the consumption, was as, as uh, painful a disease as cancer is. And so we find that they had no cure. Even uh, there, for the and consumption come upon many. But the Lord could cure it. It's the same thing about, you know, the leprosy. You know, leprosy at one time in the Old Testament was an incurable disease, and, and only the Lord could cure it. And only God could cure that of leprosy. And so we find... As we think about this tonight and thinking about sin, the Lord Jesus is the only one that can cure sin. And so we find he can cure sin. And so sin is a killer. Sin is a murderer. Sin brings about death. And those who stay with it were going to commit it. Notice the Bible said in the book of Ezekiel, Behold, all souls are mine as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth it shall die. It shall die. The soul that sins, it shall die. The results of sin is a corpse. The results of sin is a casket. And the results of sin is a cemetery. This is the results of sin. But you know, sin, do you think that, you know, like a lot of people today, you know, we've had a lot of, there's been a lot of controversy, you know that, in the last uh, year, I'd say, or more, about this uh, thing of smoking. You know, about on the airlines and in the restaurants and the public places and, uh, and the federal offices and different places of smoking. And a lot of places, you know, have no smoking anymore. And then there's a lot of a controversy about, you know, it's been said about, uh, some say, well, uh, the secondhand smoke is just as bad as you smoking yourself. You know, you inhaling. I don't know. They... They claim this to be true according to the medical, medical profession. But anyway, we find that there's been a lot said about smoking. And yet some will say, well, the only one that I'm harming 
with my smoking is myself. It's my body. It's my life. I feel like the only one I'm harming is myself, is, my, is, only, is myself, and that's the only one. But what about sin? Some say, well, I can commit this sin and it harms no one else. Is that true? The sins that you and I commit, does it not involve, you think, others? I think the sins that I, you and I commit really involves others. What about, that, uh, what about going back? What about when Adam and Eve sinned? Did it involve others? It sure did. It involved every one of us. Did you know that? Because sin was passed upon all mankind because they sinned. Had you ever thought about the four L's? The four L's? And when Adam and Eve sinned, first of all, they listened. They, li they listened to the devil. Secondly, she looked. She looked. Thirdly, she lusted. She lusted. Fourthly, she lost. What'd she lose? Lost that place of paradise. Lost fellowship with God. And become sinners in the sight of God. Think about that. How they listen. And when you and I listen to the devil, we're going to get into it. And, and, they, and, and, and they listen. And they look. And you know what I'm saying? They show us today. They show us uh, uh, on, a, on a PD, TV, and, and pictures and everything else. They show us that sin looks good. It, it's a beautiful thing looking at it. And then when we look at it and when we listen to Satan, that brings about the lust in our life. And we begin to lust in, and say, I, I'd like to have that. Or I, I know these things. We begin to lust after it. And then when the lust comes about, as the Bible said here, what? For every man is tempted when he's thrown away of his own lust and enticed. And then the Bible said, then when he has lust conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. So you see, when we lust and sin, then we, we, we lose. We lose. We lose the fellowship with God. We lose the, that fellowship that we ought to have for Jesus when there's sin, unconfessed sin in our life. So we notice it does involve us. When you and I sin, it involves others. You know, it, it involves our own family. It involves our own children. It involves our loved ones. It involves our neighbors. It involves our friends. It involves the church. It, invi it involves everybody because it is a black mark upon my life and your life and upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And his church. It involves others. Yes. And then the Bible said in Galatians, you know, uh, there, in, and we notice, in, and it yields fruit. It brings about fruit. And I thought about, the Bible talks about <clears throat> sowing to the whirlwind. A lot of people say, well, they tell me, and they've told me in the past, and maybe they've told you whenever you begin to share and ask them about coming to the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. And, and some have said to me, well, well, well preacher, well, uh, I'm young and, and there's some wild oats. i got some wild oats to sow yet. And that's really what they are. They're wild. Because one day, them wild oats is going to come up. And they're wild. And then the Bible talks about sowing to the whirlwind. You ever notice that old whirlwind, this big thing, that whirlwind just goes around and around and around and this thing is gone. <clears throat> so sin bears fruit. Galatians said, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now notice that. <clears throat> if we sow them wild oats, we're going to sow, we're going to reap wild oats. If we sow to the flesh, as the Bible goes on to say in verse 8, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. If we continue to live after the flesh and obey the Spirit uh, and obey the flesh and not the Spirit of God, he says what? We're going to reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap 
life everlasting. He said, what are we not? We're not to obey the flesh. We're not to sow to the flesh. But we are to live according to the Spirit of God. And you know something? That's one of the main reasons, I think, that Jesus Christ gave unto us and said, I'm going to send back the Holy Spirit and He'll live and dwell within you to guide and direct you. And that's one of the main office works of the Holy Spirit is to let us know not to sin and when we do sin, it's to confess the sins and not to do wrong in the sight of the Lord, not to sow unto the flesh, but to be obedient unto the Spirit. Well, you know, there's the, there's the fruit as we sow back a while ago, the fruit of life. The Bible talks about the fruit of life in Hosea, and then it talks about, as I mentioned a while ago in Hosea, you find that the fruit of the, of the whirlwind, about the whirlwind. How? And then we find that also, lastly tonight, that it leads to the very pits of hell. Sin leads to the very pits of hell. You know, I think some of the awesome words that we and I can find in the Word of God is these words right here. For the Lord Jesus Christ said, in Matthew 25, 41. When the Lord then shall he say. But here is when the Lord said. Depart from me. And to. That ever. Everlasting fire. Now Jesus called it an everlasting fire. Some say it's not everlasting, but Jesus calls it an everlasting fire. And then what did he say? Who was it prepared for? He goes on to say it was prepared for the devil and his angels. And if it was it was prepared for the devil and his angels, and, and those that go there today, they go there as intruders because it was not prepared for them. But they go there because they made the choice. Then you think about one of the verse over here in, in the 21st chapter of the verse in, of Revelation in verse 8. Notice what the Bible said in verse 8. But the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That is the second death. Sin, the result of sin. Yes, sin is on the rampage today. Sin is having a heyday today. But like old Dr. R.G. Lee said, on that great sermon that he preached, I forgot how many times, over a hundred times, I think, or even more. There's a payday someday. There's a payday someday for sin. But you think about it tonight. Jesus paid for your sin and mine. He paid. And not only did he pay for us, but every person in this ministry, every person in this Every person in this state, every person in this nation, every person in this world, Jesus paid the sin debt on the cross. Well, he paid the debt for it. But he left it, left it up to them whether to receive him or reject him. Yes, the results of sin is costly. It costs heaven the best that heaven had. And that was God's only begotten Son. Shall we pray? Our Father, I'm sure that most of us have already felt in this loss of life some results of sin in our lives, of some wild sowing. And then, Father, help us to know and realize today afresh and new 
that our sins that in which we commit against you, O oh God, that they do involve others. Now, Father, that it may have a bearing upon our own children, upon our own loved ones. It has an influence upon them. And most of all, Lord Jesus, we're sinning against you. And as David said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Father, I pray today that each of us shall see our own sins and confess them. And I pray, dear Lord Jesus, tonight for those that are in this community, those that have their names upon this church roll, I pray that you shall prick their hearts tonight and remind them of their sins. May our Father, thy Holy, thy Holy Spirit, prick their hearts and remind them of their sins. I pray that they will call upon the name of the Lord and confess those sins. Jesus, we know and realize the reason that our nation is in the problem it's in today is because of sin. We know that because the wealth condition of our churches are in today is because of sin. Their sin in the camp. And God, I pray truly that we might confess these sins. Have your precious we away in this time of invitation, Jesus.